Good morning, all. Good turnout. I'm glad, very happy to see that. <clears throat> Let's uh, real quickly remind everybody of what's going on here. Uh, today is Friday, uh, April 24th. And this is the histology review. Uh, this again is optional but definitely can help uh, you to be able to understand this information. And again, to help to encourage people to do the lab work and familiarize yourself with your histology. As we talked about in lecture tomorrow, uh, uh, you can complete uh, your histology handout and turn it in for up to 10 points of extra credit. Again, you must complete all the drawings. You must label all the drawings. <clears throat> Color would be nice, but is not required. And again, you're not being graded on your uh, drawing skills, just uh, completing this activity. And again, remember, it's going to be due uh, by the beginning of class on Tuesday. And that is April, uh, what's Tuesday? Looks <clears throat> like 28th uh, at noon. All righty. That up. Questions on any of that? You guys asleep already? Like I said, as we talked about in class, I appreciate you taking the time to come in. Hopefully this will be a useful exercise for you. Uh, again, like this is exactly what we're gonna do like we've done in the class where we're going to look at the handout and go through the handout step by step. My goal at this point isn't to be tricky. Uh, so again, we just go down the line and asking these questions. I expect you to try to answer these questions and we will make sure that I will give you the ticks and tricks and tips that I have uh, to help you to be successful at being able to recognize these things. Um, what I will say is that none of these pictures, I believe, are from your textbook. Uh, from your uh, PAL, uh, you know, at, at, you know, the atlas from your uh, from your histology atlas that you have, or any of the other resources that are available to you. Uh, <clears throat> I figure you already have those pictures, so you don't need me to provide you with those pictures to help you to understand that. So I did kind of what you should be doing with these things. Uh, when I want to see something, I go to the Almighty Google. I, again, don't start with Google, as we've talked about before. Uh, because your search is, even though as narrow as you try to make your search, not everything that comes up in your search is going to be appropriate. So it is better to start with your histology atlas, your textbook, your professional anatomy lab, all of the other resources that you have readily available to you. Uh, the CRC site is an excellent site that, uh, again, has some decent histology and some other things along those lines as well. Those are the places to begin with. Then as you start getting comfortable with this material, that's when you go to the almighty Google, where you'll see lots of different varieties at lots of different magnifications at lots of different planes of sections with lots of different stains, all showing you this material uh, in really fun and interesting ways. And so that helps you to get familiar with it. Because again, on the exam, uh, my goal is not for you to memorize the pictures from your textbook. My goal is for you to be able to understand this material. So I have no problem showing you a novel picture you may have never seen before, um, so that uh, as long as it's an obvious example of things. And so that's the other thing I'd say as well. Like I said, I went to Google for these, so not only were none of these from the textbook or anything else, none of these were pictures I've used on the exam as well. So this is all novel material. It could end up on its exam as I'm writing new questions for this exam, obviously, uh, but uh, I will not exclusively be using these for the exams if they fall onto it or not. Uh, it's irrelevant. Um, 
what I will say is that while putting this one together, and remember I did something similar for my 431 class as well, what I did find is a tremendous amount of the pictures that I were finding that I really liked came from a, a Yale histology site. So I've added that Yale histology site to your uh, useful tools in the modules. So that module in the useful tools uh, in your Canvas site. Uh, so that you can go to it. It is really excellent. Uh, there, It is uh, filled with material. What's really awesome about it is it has some great pictures. Uh, you can view the pictures with or without the labels. There's some nice descriptions. It is an excellent site. So as you're working with the histology, I, I strongly encourage you to, uh, to take a look at it because it is definitely something that could be useful. And I'd say like, at least a third of the pictures, it seemed like it, it, every time I pulled a picture, it seemed like that was the site that it was coming from. It was pretty crazy. All righty, so that is the introduction. Let's go ahead and get away from the whiteboard now and instead switch to our slides. Now again, these are dynamic, pardon me, these are static slides. This is not the actual microscope, so I can't move around uh, or do anything like that, change the magnification. And they're all not necessarily the most ideal pictures, but because uh, I did this in a bit of a hurry uh, between yesterday and today, uh, to be able to get this done. But like I said, I always think that uh, histology is important. I think it is definitely worthwhile to take the time to go through this. So again, we've been so locked into our lecture, we haven't had a tremendous time to talk about brain anatomy. So there will be some new stuff that we'll be talking about here, but we'll take our time and work our way through it and make sure that you guys understand it. But this is a brain. Right, as we have talked about before, and in fact, the spinal cord as well. Uh, there is this big, huge, as we talked about, midden-shaped structure, this big, huge thing here. This is our cerebrum. And uh, what we also talked about and emphasized here in the last class, so let's use the highlighter here, change the color to something to stand out a little bit more. This little uh, individual hemisphere uh, or really two hemispheres that are kind of on the posterior part of the brain here is a structure known as the cerebellum. Uh, this illustration doesn't uh, show it quite as well, but there it does hint at it with these lines here and here and here, and now my line's too thick for you to be able to see that. Uh, but there are many invaginations. If we were to take a simplistic look at this, basically what it has is it has raised ridges and then it has grooves. We have this type of an organization to the cerebellum and uh, notice it's similar to the organization we have in the cerebrum as well. The good news is they share some similarities. Uh, the grooves, are what are known as sulcus, is the plural, I mean is the singular, uh, sulci is the plural. So the groove in between these raised ridges is gonna be known as the sulcus. And that is true for both the cerebrum and the cerebellum. However, if we've learned anything, anatomists hate us. So the raised ridges on the cerebrum and the cerebellum are gonna be named differently on the cerebellum, well, let's go cerebrum first. In the cerebrum, these raised ridges are going to be known as a gyri, is the a plural, or gyrus is the singular. In the cerebellum, uh, they are known as folia. Folia being the plural, or folium being the singular. So since our first uh, histology journey is here to the cerebellum, we are gonna be looking at these gyri, pardon me, at these folia and the sulci as we do that. So let's go ahead and clear our drawing and go ahead and switch to our first histology slide. And here we see it. Notice again, we have our uh, raised ridges. This raised ridge is the folia and then the invagination is the sulcus. So again, if we draw this, and I think the highlighter will be a good starting point. So again, we have these raised ridges, which are the folia, and then they go down into this sulcus, and then another folia, 
and another sulcus and so on and so forth. Now let me cheat with my drawing here and give us a little bit of space. There is one other thing that we have kind of talked about a little bit, but I want to emphasize as well. When we are talking about, as in particular, our brain and spinal cord, so our central nervous system. Uh, hold on, I see a question in my chat window, which apparently is not up. There it is. That's what I'm getting to next, absolutely. That is exactly the next question I'm going to ask. So thank you for asking that. Uh, I'm about to answer that question right now. When we're talking about the brain and the spinal cord, the brain and the spinal cord is basically has um, two types of tissue. Uh, actually, that's not really the right way to say. Uh, two organizations, let's say it that way. If you think about it, our nervous tissue, as we've talked about, is made up of neurons and uh, neuroglial cells. And neurons have two parts. We have the cell bodies and we have the axons. And as we've talked about, most of our axons are myelinated. So when we talk about those two parts, they form the two different organizations to the tissue. In our brain and spinal cord, we are going to have collections of cell bodies. And our collections of cell bodies collectively is known as the gray matter. We have our gray matter and that is the collection of cell bodies. And those are going to be our cortex, uh, those are going to be things like our horns. And those are also going to be things like we talked about our nuclei. Oops. Those are all collections of cell bodies. Axons, because they're mostly myelinated, and again, they're myelinated by lipids, fats, they are going to be our nerves. Right? Uh, or let me say it this way, there are white matter. And that white matter includes our nerves that we've talked about, which are bundles of axons, uh, but they're also going to be our tracks as well. Okay? So all of our nervous tissue has this, has gray matter, has white matter, our brain and spinal cord. And we see that here as well. Let me go ahead and erase this to emphasize it. What we have here, and I'll go ahead and draw it in, and let's use black. How we are able to distinguish that this is the cerebellum, since both the cerebrum and the cerebellum have nooks and crannies, and both the cerebrum and cerebellum have white matter and gray matter. Another thing that they share in common is both the cerebrum and the cerebellum the white matter is deep. So notice this white region that we see here, this lighter color region here, this branch I've drawn, and here's a little bit of it coming out this way and more of it coming up this way. All of this in here is the white matter. So the white matter is deep in our cerebrum and our cerebellum and the gray matter is superficial. And in fact, the gray matter is this entire region from here to here. So this is our gray matter. Now notice something about our cerebrum here. Notice our gray matter is not uniform. Our gray matter has two regions. And that is how you're gonna be able to tell you're in the cerebellum. The cerebellum is the only place in our nervous tissue where our gray matter has two distinct layers. They are the cellular layer and the molecular layer, but you do not need to know to distinguish them. What you do need to be able to do is tell them apart. And as you can see here fairly clearly, it is pretty easy to tell them apart. So again, anywhere that I look on this, 
This is the gray matter, layer one, layer two, and this is the white matter. This is gray matter, layer one, layer two, superficial. This is the white matter, deep, whoops, and so on and so forth. So the way we can tell it's the cerebellum is that it has two layers to the gray matter. All right, that's the easy uh, way to be able to accomplish that. So when we see this, the two layers of the gray matter, we know we're in the cerebellum. Let's go ahead and clear all of this and look at a second picture. Notice we can see the same thing. Again, here we see the white matter that is deep and here are the two layers of the gray matter. So we have a folia, we have a sulcus, we have our white matter, we have our gray matter. Now let's come back to this one. Notice when we look at our white matter here, the white matter has this kind of elaborate branching appearance. In fact, the white matter of the cerebellum has kind of a tree-like appearance. And that's what it's called. The entire white matter structure of our cerebellum is known as the arbor vitae. Arbor vitae means tree of life, because this is the tree of life here. These are the elaborate branches of the tree of life. Uh, this is our arbor vitae. So our white matter forms the arbor vitae. Notice at a high magnification view, we don't really see the whole tree but we do see it nicely at the lower magnification. However, there is something special that we are able to see here at the higher magnification. We can still see our three layers. Here's our white matter, and here are the two layers of the gray matter. But I want you to notice something else, and I'm gonna go ahead and color them in red. Notice here and here, actually, you know what, hold on clear those. Let's use the highlighter so that I, we can see through it. There, 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 there. I skipped one. There, there. Let's look over on this side. There, 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 there. Notice on the border of the two layers of the gray matter, there are these cell bodies. Nice, big, prominent cell bodies that are located easy to find because they're always on the border between the two layers of the gray matter in our cerebellum. And guess what cells those are? Oh wait. They are neurons, absolutely. They are neurons, bah, but more specifically, absolutely, they are our Purkinje cells. Remember, again, we're going down the list. My goal isn't to be tricky here. My goal is to be interactive, so I will ask questions, but you should have the answers right in front of you. If you don't have your histology list in front of you, then at least bring it up on your phone or something like that so you can look at that while you're doing it, if you don't already have it printed out, because the answers are all right there in front of you. Absolutely. Remember, we said the Purkinje cells were found in one place and one place only. And that's another important thing. Remember, as we're looking at the... Um, as we are looking at the nervous tissue, the things to remember is the three things that are related to each other are location, structural classification, and functional classification. Oops. If we know one, we will know, we should know, or be able to figure out the other two. Yes, so here, let me, in our highlighter, um, let's change to something really, let's change to white, this should be work. So notice right here deep, there's this thin structure right here. This thin structure right here, and here's the same thing right here. This is the thin strip of white matter that is deep at the center of our uh, folia for our cerebellum. So all of this stuff that we see, and let's go ahead and change the color to yellow. This right here is gray matter, all of this stuff here. But 
this here is also gray matter. Right? This is gray matter. And this is gray matter. Both of these are gray matters, which means these are collections of cell bodies that are found in this area. This is white matter, which means this is primarily made up of axons. But clearly, this part, which looks blue, is very different from this part that looks white. Right? Notice this is a very unique and distinct stain, different from what we saw on the previous slide. But even on the previous slide, the pink here at the center is the white matter. Then we have this dark purple stripe, and we have this light pink stripe. So once again, this two, these two layers right here are the white, uh, pardon me, are the gray matter. And there is clearly a difference between these two areas. Right there does not look like right here but they're both gray matter. And like I said, one is called the molecular layer, one is called the cellular layer. We don't need to worry about making those distinctions of names. We just need to know that they're collectively both the gray matter. They're superficial and the white matter is deep. Does that make sense? Does that help? Yes. Excellent. All right. Now, notice at this magnification, and this is where it's awesome. Even if, even though we can't see them, we know that right here on the boundary between the two layers of the gray matter must be where the Purkinje cells are located. So again, at this magnification, we can't see them, but we know where they must be. They must be on this border between the two layers of the gray matter. So technically, I'd ask you what cell would be found in this location, but why should I bother doing something tricky like that when I can clearly just show you? And here, we much more clearly see those Purkinje cells. And again, oops, let's go back. I lost it now, so I'll put it back. Location, uh, structure. And actually, let's do it this way. Location, function, structure. All right, those are the three things that go hand in hand in hand. And we see that here. We have a location, right, the cerebellum. Now, the good news is it's the cerebellum. It's the only cell you're responsible for for the cerebellum. But we can also make it easier for ourselves by also being specific. Um, between the two layers of the gray matter. So we have our location. So now that we have a location and seeing that we are in the brain, right, the cerebellum of the brain, what do you think their functional classification might be? How many functional classifications are there? Three, excellent. And they're all related to how they move information in relation to the central nervous system. We have sensory, sensory that brings it in to the central nervous system, motor that takes it out of the uh, central nervous system, and interneurons, which are the ones in between, the integrative ones, right, that, that integrative function, right, or those interneurons, and absolutely, if this is in the brain, then of course it is gonna be integrative, and it is gonna be those interneurons. So functionally, this is an interneuron. And if it is an interneuron, what must its structural classification be? We'll talk about that, excellent. Great question. Yeah, we'll get to that. Absolutely. Multipolar. Excellent. So notice, just by knowing the location, we were able to determine the other two characteristics of this neuron. Its location is the cerebellum, it is an interneuron, and it is multipolar. We know its location, we know its function, we know its structure. 
Now, great question about the dendrites in the cell body. Notice in the plane of section here, and let's actually increase the magnification, and then we'll be able to answer that question even better. Here, notice this by itself, we really can't tell we are in, at this level of magnification, we really can't tell that we're in the cerebellum anymore. We're not seeing the ridges, we're not seeing the sulcus, we can't see the white matter. This is the uh, blood vessel right here. No, I'm saying that the Purkinje cells are between the two layers of the gray matter. That's what we're looking at right now. So if you take a look at this picture, what we are looking at right now on the next slide is if we just came right here and zoomed in right there. So what we're doing is we're taking this part of the picture and looking at it up close. And if we look at it up close, this is what it would look like. These are the two layers of the gray matter. And this is our Purkinje cell. So right here is a Purkinje cell. And here's a Purkinje cell. And here's a Purkinje cell. All right, we see the cell bodies of these really, really nicely. All right, so we can see these really nicely and really clearly. But notice what you are right, as was pointed out, what we're not really seeing are the dendrites. And that's really what these Purkinje cells are known for. If we lower the magnification again, what's special about these Purkinje cells, and we'll use yellow for this. <clears throat> they have this nice big body right here. Like all neurons, they're gonna have one axon that comes out and comes and becomes part of the white matter. But what makes these Purkinje cells so unique is they have these big, huge, elaborate dendritic trees that expand out into the superficial layer of the gray matter. Yes, I am recording this and this will be posted on YouTube so that you'll have the opportunity to, uh, uh, to review it again. So, this is the cell body and it has these elaborate dendritic trees. That's actually what they're known for is these big, huge, elaborate fan-like dendritic trees. However, when we're cutting through these randomly, we don't have a very good chance of getting the entire tree on the picture. Even uh, when we look at it at a high magnification, like on the next slide, here we can see, notice a few bits of the dendrites coming out of them. Right, a little bit of the dendrites coming off of this, but we don't really get that full elaboration. However, and I love, 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 love this picture. Here we actually have a fluorescently labeled folia of a cerebellum. Notice we can see the axons that are traveling down the white matter. Here we see the two layers of the gray matter. And here, we see those Purkinje cells. And notice this one, we can see. This one, we can see. This one, we can see. These over here, we can see. They have these beautiful, elaborate dendritic trees that come out into the superficial layer of the folium. So here is a beautiful example of a, a fluorescently labeled Purkinje cell with this big, huge, elaborate dendritic tree. All righty, questions on that? So that is our uh, cerebellum at both a low magnification and a high magnification. And again, I love this picture. This picture is so beautiful of this. They, they, this is actual real tissue that they have labeled with a whole bunch of, uh, of fluorescent dyes to make each of these cells individually light up like that. It's really, really stunning. All right. Uh, so, uh, I, so these, this here, uh, this is the white matter here. This is the white matter. So again, if you think of it here, here we see the white matter coming along there. Those are the axons. Remember axons form 
the white matter. All right. Any other questions on the cerebellum? All righty. Then let's talk about our next slide. Our next slide involves the spinal cord. Here is the spinal cord. Uh, we'll talk about spinal cord anatomy in a little bit, but notice as part of the central nervous system, it has gray matter, it has white matter, but notice that the orientation of it on our spinal cord is different. Whereas in the brain, the cerebrum and the cerebellum, the gray matter is on the outside and the white matter is on the inside. It's the opposite on the spinal cord. Notice the spinal cord, it is the white matter that is superficial and it is the gray matter that is deep. Notice like the cerebrum and cerebellum, we have two hemispheres. It has a little hole in the middle called the central canal and it has gray matter. And even at this low magnification, these dark spots you see on it are the uh, neurons and their cell bodies. Okay, but if you notice, the next slide we have to look at is a spinal cord smear. Guess how we get a spinal cord smear? It's not a trick question. How do you think we get a spinal cord smear? Absolutely, you take the spinal cord and you smear it on a slide. What that does is it breaks up all of this tissue. And instead of having this nice, beautiful, precise organization, it looks a little something like this. But the advantage of doing a spinal cord smear is that it spreads the cells out and allows you to see the cells more clearly. All right, now this is again a fairly unique um, prep. There is really no tissue here. It's just spread across the slide in this crazy appearance. And so again, that tells you a couple things. That tells us a location. We are in the spinal cord. So we have a location here. Notice also, we have some cells here, some neurons. And remember, neurons are identified structurally by how many processes they have coming off of it. So I don't know, let's just grab this one for instance. How many processes does it have? One, two, three. How many does this one have? One, two, three, four. Really, do I have to keep counting after I get to three? No, because after I get to three or more, what do I know the structural classification of these must be? Absolutely. These are all multipolar. And because we're in the spinal cord and we are multipolar, the most common type of neuron that is found in the, um, well, let's say, uh, actually, let's go cheat and sneak back a, a picture. As we sneak back, notice most of the gray matter is in this enlargement right here in our spinal cord. And look at all the black dots, the dark dots that are in here. This enlargement is what is known as the anterior gray horn. Okay, so when we go back to our next slide, and let's erase the arrow, we have the spinal cord and we have these neurons. We know that these neurons most likely came from the anterior gray horn of the spinal cord. We have a location. We can tell by looking at them, they are multipolar. And as we will talk about in class, and I'll mention right here, anterior gray horn cells are the ones whose axons go out and communicate with your skeletal muscle. They form a synapse on skeletal muscle. And if they form a synapse and control skeletal muscle, what would their functional classification be? There you go, and not just motor, but here we can be more precise, somatic motor. So once again, we have location, we have function, we have structure. 
and they all go together. By recognizing this as a spinal cord prep, a smear prep, we can recognize this as that multipolar somatic motor neuron. Now notice a couple other things about it as well as we look at it. Notice uh, one of the things that's kind of interesting about our, and I think uh, this one shows it a teeny bit better. Notice we've gotten an even higher magnification view of this. Again, we can count the number of processes that are coming off of this, but once we get past two, we really don't have to keep counting anymore. One other important thing, again, notice I keep using the word process. We know processes mean dendrites and axons, but I'm not gonna hold you responsible for telling those apart. Instead, we're just going to know the collective. Is it possible to tell which one is the axon and which one are the dendrites? Absolutely. Do I expect you to be able to do it? Absolutely not. So that's why we just use the generic term process. You don't have to tell the difference between a dendrite and an axon as we look at these things. Okay. But notice, again, not only do we know the structure, the function, and the location, but there's some other things we can tell as well. Notice normally, on a neuron, uh, in a, pardon me, when we look at a cell under the microscope, normally it's the nucleus that is the darkest thing. That is not the case here. Notice we have all this dark purple stain filling the majority of our neuron, and that is the nissel bodies. And what did we learn the nissel body actually is? Yeah, the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Notice here, and I'll go ahead and put a circle around it, we can tell where the nucleus is, and primarily we can tell where the nucleus is by all the little dark spots inside of it. Remember, the point of having all this rough ER is to make a lot of proteins. And if you're gonna need, make a lot of proteins, you need a lot of uh, messenger RNA. And when you make messenger RNA, you get this condensing of material inside the nucleus. We have our nucleoli. And notice we have many nucleoli in here. Notice also we can see uh, the cytoskeletal structures, the linear structures that are helping to form here. You see them really, really well. See these nice linear structures. Those are the neurofibrils, part of our cytoskeleton. They help to form the processes and give stabilization to this. And there's all these dark specks out here as well, all over the place. These dark specks are the nuclei of the neural glial cells, right? Remember, when we take that spinal cord and we smear it on the slide, not only do we spread out the neurons, we spread out the neural glial cells as well. Now notice them, we just see as a single uh, nucleus. By looking at this nucleus, can we tell whether it's an astrocyte or an ependymal cell or a microglial cell or anything along those lines? No, so we just, again, are gonna collectively be able to say that these are just the neuroglial cells. And to answer the previous question, yes. Neuro well, they don't make up the processes, but they form the infrastructure to, to support the processes. Remember, our neurofibrils are the proteins that form the cytoskeleton. And remember, cytoskeleton provides the shape and structure for a cell. And if you as a cell are gonna have a lot of processes, you need to stabilize those processes in place, right? If you're gonna have a building that has a lot of wings coming off of it, it needs a lot of structure to hold it and stabilize it and keep it in space. And that's what the neurofibrils are. So I wouldn't say they make up the processes, I would say they support the processes. And so that's why you see a lot of them in the processes. All right. So notice, this is our second multipolar neuron we've looked at, but it was in a different location, so we knew it had a different function and a different name, right? The first one was a Purkinje cell. Uh, the name of this one is just an anterior gray horn neuron, right? Or we could call it the somatic motor neuron if we wanted to name it by its function. All right, questions on that? All right, but multipolar are not the only neurons we have. We also have unipolar neurons. Now, it turns out the unipolar neurons 
are actually not located in the spinal cord. Here we are at the spinal cord again. But out here associated with the spinal cord, this enlarged structure right here, and we'll do it on the other side. Notice all these structures are paired. Here, this big, and that goes there. And then, I don't know how to, there we go, that works. That kind of structure, so it's all in here. I gotta make it more narrow. I don't know how to do that. Well, we'll do it that way, that works. These structures to the side are our collections of cell bodies outside of the central nervous system. And remember, we called this a ganglion, a collection of cell bodies outside the central nervous system we call a ganglion. There are many ganglia. This particular one happens to be associated with this structure. So notice right here, and I'm gonna highlight it, this structure right here are axons that come out of the back of our spinal cord. Remember, this was the anterior gray horn. So not surprisingly, this back here is the posterior gray horn. And this structure coming out of the back of it is what is known as the dorsal root. Now notice here I use posterior, here I use dorsal. Remember those terms are interchangeable. So I could also call this the posterior root. I could also call this the dorsal gray horn. By convention, and again, the terms as they're usually used, anterior and posterior is used inside, dorsal and ventral is used on the outside. I have no idea why. But again, remember these terms are interchangeable. But the point is, this ganglion is on the dorsal root, so not surprisingly, it is known as the dorsal root ganglion. Boom, we have a location. And if we have a location, then we know a structure and we know a function. And so I will tell you right now, even though we can't see a single neuron that is in there, what I will tell you is the same way we know all of the neurons in the anterior gray horn are multipolar and somatic motor, all of the neurons in the dorsal, oops, I spelled dorsal correctly. All of the neurons located in the dorsal root ganglia structure, pardon me, functionally are sensory. And if they're sensory neurons, what should their structural classification be? Unipolar, perfect. Unipolar. Now, again, we can't see anything of that in this illustration, but this is our spinal cord, so it is a nice starting point. So let's clear that and take a look at a better picture. Notice here, there's that dorsal root coming in and we see the beginning of our dorsal root ganglion. And notice we see all of these clusters, large clusters, almost like nests of neurons that are found throughout here. And this is useful because notice before, when we first thing we saw when we looked at the neuron is we counted the processes. This is a pretty low magnification, but the advantage of it is I see a lot of neurons. Do you see any processes? Because I don't. But remember, these are unipolar. So think of it this way. If you threw an apple in the air, closed your eyes and use a knife to cut it, what are the chances that you're gonna cut that apple so perfectly that you get half of the stem and you can actually see the stem on the cut edge. Is that likely to happen? Yeah, it's not gonna happen at all. And that's what's happening here. Remember, these just have one process coming off of it. So the chances that you cut it just right to see that process coming off is practically 0%. And we see that even better when we increase the magnification. Whoops, wrong direction. 
Here we see one of those nests. Here we see some nests where we see a large number of big round cells with no obvious nuclei. Pardon me, no, not the nucleus, very obvious, with no obvious uh, processes. So the fact that they're all circular is kind of a hint that these could be unipolar. There are a couple other things that are big hints that these are unipolar. Remember, these are in a ganglia, which is outside the central nervous system. And notice there is a ring of cells that wrap around that cell body, almost like a halo or a crown around the outer surface of these cells. Wasn't there a neuroglial cell that likes to surround the cell bodies of our neurons in the peripheral nervous system? What were those neuroglial cells called again? Not the Schwann cells. Remember, Schwann cells wrap around the axons. Weren't there cells that wrapped around the cell bodies? Kind of like halos. Or one might even argue like satellites in space wrapping around the orbit of that. Absolutely. The satellite cells. There you go. Perfect. So we see satellite cells. We see circular cells all clustered together. This is our dead giveaway that we are in a dorsal root ganglion. And again, if we're in that dorsal root ganglion, we can tell there's no processes, so these are unipolar. And like I said, if they're unipolar, they are sensory. So once again, the location that we were able to recognize from the anatomy of this, or the fact that they're unipolar, we could do it the other way around. If the fact that it's unipolar is the most obvious thing, these circle cells are unipolar, then you know they're sensory. And if you know they're sensory and unipolar, you know there must be in the dorsal root ganglion. So notice one of these pieces of information tells you the next. Now, if I look at the list here, I see there's one more thing I'm missing. And notice as you look at these cells, and I'll just draw little lines on them, this cell and this cell and this cell and this cell, all of those are unipolar sensory neurons. But notice the colors of them are different. Yes, I know I have a nucleus, and that nucleus has a nucleolus on it. There's one. Here's another nucleus with some nucleoli, so we can see those. That's not necessarily what I'm talking about. This one, you can see the nucleus really clearly, and four nucleoli on here. Yes. The dorsal root ganglia is the only place where you will find the satellite cells. Well, the, the, uh, the satellite cells, because this is the only place you'll find these unipolar neurons. That is correct. Satellite cells just wrap around the cell bodies of these unipolar neurons in the dorsal root ganglion. So that's why it's a dead giveaway. Great question. But notice, getting back to what we were saying, these have different colorations to them. This is very light. This is very dark. These are kind of in between. What's interesting about these unipolar neurons is when they're metabolically active, they produce this fat that is undigestible, this undigestible fat, and it accumulates inside of the cell. All the studies that have ever been done on it, it doesn't appear to affect the function in any way. It's just this weird uh, substance that accumulates in the cell, and that substance happens to like stain. So when we process the tissue, that, uh, that substance stores a lot of the stain and makes it very dark. So it just gives it a pigment, but it doesn't really affect function. It's kind of like those liver spots on grandpa. As it gets old, he gets those dark spots. As these cells get old, they get more metabolically active, they get these dark spots, but it doesn't affect the function. And guess what this dark pigment inside these cells is called? Well, what's the one thing on your list we haven't identified yet? Lipofusion, absolutely. And again, that it's an undigestible fat. Lipo, of course, means fat, lipids. Yep, so the different coloration we see to these unipolar cells is because of the different amounts of lipofusion. And it really is just a pigment. There really is no function to it at all. All right.
Sorry. That was a Coke, not a beer. All righty. Questions on this one? I think that is everything we're responsible for here. Then let us then from here go to the most beautiful organ in the entire body. Uh, Schwann cells in between those coming off. Uh, so yes and no. The, you are correct in that if we were to go back here, or even here, this, this structure here are the axons from these going out. And these axons, absolutely most of them are myelinated. And these that are myelinated will have the Schwann cells on them. So remember, it's the satellite cells that wrap around the cell bodies. It's the Schwann cells that wrap around the axons. All right, does that answer your question? All righty. So we have done multipolar. We have done unipolar. So that leaves us one type left. Yes, these are sensory neurons, absolutely. Unipolar neurons are sensory neurons. We've done multi, we've done uni. So what does that leave us with? There you go. And bipolar, remember, are sensory, but they're only found in a few unique locations, special sensory locations, including the most beautiful of all sensory specialized structures, and that is the eye. Here, we have a cross section through an eye. This up here is your cornea. Here is your iris. Uh, it gives the pigmentation to your eye and controls the light that comes in. Here is our lens that takes the light and refracts the light and focuses it. And it focuses it on this amazing, beautiful, spectacular, uh, practically magical structure that is located here on the back part of your eyeball, and that is a structure called the retina. And that retina is where we're gonna find our bipolar neurons. So let's take a closer look at that retina. Here we go. Again, light comes in from the front of the eye this way. And notice, and again, I'll give you a second of quiet to just take it in and awe, be impressed by its beauty and inspired by it. What we have here, as you can see, is a couple important structures. The first important structure, and I'll just highlight it here, is this darkly pigmented structure on the back of the eye. This is called the pigmented epithelium. We are diurnal creatures meaning we are active during the day, uh, meaning that there is more than sufficient light for us to be able to perceive the world around us. In fact, there's too much of it. So if we really want clarity, again, if you think about your computer screen or your TV screen, if you turn up the brightness too much, you lose all the contrast. You lose, lose you know, just a big, huge blur of bright light. We don't want that. So we have this huge darkly pigmented epithelium on the back, which helps to absorb most of the light that comes into our eyes. But the other thing we have, and I'll label them here, one, uh, let's do white so it stands out more. Uh, hold on. One. two, three layers of cells that we can see the nuclei of. These three layers of cells, as you can see, are fairly precisely organized. And these three layers have very important functions. Layer one, and again, if you think about how many nuclei are in here, Right, even on the smallest piece of the retina. Anybody want to count the number of nuclei that are in this row right here? I don't want, right? Extra credit, two points of extra credit to count all the nuclei. Somebody want to do that for two points of extra credit? Would that be worth your time for just two points? 
I know some of you are really worried about your grades, but I'm hoping that you wouldn't take all the time to count all of the cells right here for just two points of extra credit. Exactly. These are your photoreceptors. You have trillions of photoreceptors in your eyes. These are their cell bodies. This is where the nucleus is. And these lines we see coming out from them, these are our photoreceptors, right? What you may know as your rods and cones. Maybe that may be a term you guys have heard before. It is your rods and cones that perceive the light. These neurons here in row three are what we call your retinal ganglion cells. Remember, a ganglion is a collection of cell bodies, neurons, and these neurons' job is to carry this information to our brain. In fact, this light area here is actually the axons. Basically, what happens, uh, let's use, Dark red will show up. The axon of this comes out, becomes part of this, and then ultimately travels to your brain to tell you you've seen light. So these are the cells that send the information to our brain. These here are the cells with their nucleus and their photoreceptor that perceive the light. And what we need is a way to bring these two things together. And that's what this row here in the center does. We have a cell here, and I'm going to exaggerate the size of this uh, for effect. We have this cell here located in the center that is going to have one dendrite that comes out to it so that it can receive information from hundreds of photoreceptors. It then takes that information and gives it to one of these retinal ganglion cells. So notice all these cells in the second layer here have one dendrite coming in, one axon going out. So of course, based on its shape, what is its structural classification? Absolutely, this is a bipolar. So structurally, it is bipolar. And of course, being bipolar, we of course know its function. What is its function? It's the function of the bipolar neurons. Come on, I know you guys know. Well, okay, here in the eye, it's certainly not going to be smell or taste. It's going to be special sensory, right? Remember, most sensory are unipolar, but special sensory are bipolar. But you're right. Not only vision, but smell and taste are other ones that use bipolar neurons as well. However, when we have these three beautiful lines of cells, right, this clearly, the location we are at, based on this beautiful image is, of course, the retina. Oops, helps if I spell it right. So once again, we have a location, we have a structure, we have a function. And now we've seen that with multipolar, now we've seen that with bipolar, now we've seen that with unipolar neurons. Again, I can't emphasize this enough. This is what we're going to be doing in this class. We're going to be talking about structure, function, and location. There's a lot of histology, but the good thing about it is if you can figure out one of these three things, if you can uh, recognize this as the retina, then you know the other two pieces of information. If you know that dorsal root ganglion and you're able to recognize that, then you know it's sensory, you know it's unipolar, or maybe the other way around. Maybe seeing that big circular cell. Uh, with the satellite uh, cells around the outside, that halo of satellite cells, uh, is a dead giveaway that that's a unipolar neuron. And if it's a unipolar neuron, you know it must be sensory, and you know it must be located in the dorsal root ganglion. So notice having one of these pieces of information give you the other ones. All right. All righty. What that leaves us with is I'm looking at our list. 
is our spinal cord. We are going to talk about spinal cord. This is actually where we're going to begin our lecture on uh, Tuesday. So I don't want to spend too much time on this. I did like this, so I do want to show you this as our starting point. Remember, once again, there's going to be this key between function, structure, and location. As we talked about, our gray matter is to the center. And notice here in particular, we can see there's three distinct enlargements to our gray matter. The dorsal horn, the ventral horn, right, or anterior and posterior, and the lateral horn. Each of these regions contains different cells with different functions. Again, notice we have the dorsal root coming out. And that's one other thing I want to emphasize. Uh, one of the ways we need to be able to recognize this is that notice the uh, anterior root is usually the largest root. Right? There's just a little ventral and a slightly bigger posterior. Notice this posterior or ventral root, pardon me, ventral horn is where the ventral root comes out. Notice because of the way this is put on the slide, our dorsal root ganglion is actually on the front side of the spinal cord. So don't be confused by that. Just because this is down here in the front doesn't mean this is the back. You have to follow the axons. This is the back and it travels around this way. So again, this is the dorsal root, even though on the slide, they've, on the image, they've moved it to the front. All right, and that's often the case. Notice they did the same thing here. You can see it's broken up, it's not continuous, but this is that dorsal root that would be coming down to the dorsal root ganglion. So even though it's towards the front, you have to follow the root to get to it. And quite frankly, I wouldn't use this one on the exam. I would use this one because it's very clear that this is coming off the back. So this is very clearly ventral, uh, uh, pardon me, dorsal, and this is very clearly the dorsal root. So I would have no problem with that. And the same way there are regions of the gray matter, there's regions of the white matter, what we call our columns, and they have organization to them as well. But like I said, we'll talk about that more uh, when we get into class. I think I'll save that part for class. What I do want to finish with is the last couple slides uh, that we have on here, because this is stuff that I think will be a little bit more straightforward. Notice uh, what we have here is a nerve that has been teased, right? Again, if you remember way back when we did the muscular system, we looked at teased smooth muscle where we were able to pull the cells apart. And that's what they've done here. They've pulled the axons apart. Now notice clearly when you've done that, they tend to get damaged. So we see a lot of broken ends to our axons. But notice also all the dark stuff that you're seeing right now are the myelin. So really what you're seeing are the Schwann cells. Someone mentioned about the Schwann cells before. Here, we actually get to see the Schwann cells around the axon. So we really don't see the axon, we see the Schwann cells around them. Now, we do know there are gaps, and if we take a little bit of a closer look, notice again here we see a torn end of one of these axons, but the dark structure we see here are the Schwann cells. But notice what's happening, and let's put a circle around it, right here. Notice this isn't damage. This right here is actually where one Schwann cell stops and the next one begins. So this right here, we can actually see the node. This is the node, that node of Ranvier, where the two Schwann cells meet on the axon. And notice it's very tiny. We don't really ever see, here's another great node over here. Right here, we see the node right there. So, right, so these are our nodes. We can see where the two Schwann cells are coming and meeting each other. And then in between is where, again, we're going to be able to produce that new action potential to have it spread rapidly down the axon. The last thing I want to show you, and again, notice there's not a lot on the list, but those are the things you need to see for this teased one. The other thing I want to show you, and again, even though we haven't talked about it in class, I think it's useful because really you have already learned this. It's One of those things where you learn a piece of information once and you get to use it twice, right? We did that with um, uh, the bones of the skull, right? We used those a couple times. We're gonna use this a couple times. Here is a nerve. 
Notice a nerve isn't just a random bundle of axons that are thrown together. Instead, what we have, actually, and these are multiple nerves that we see here, what we have are bundles of axons that are individual axons that are bundled up into small bundles. Those bundles, along with blood vessels and some adipose, are bundled together by more connective tissue into the big bundle that is a nerve. And even though we can't see it at this level, as it turns out, each individual nerve has a little bit of connective tissue that wraps around it and isolates it. Then we have a second connective tissue that bundles those together into a structure. And that structure just happens to be called a fascicle. And then all of these fascicles, as well as some blood vessels, are going to be bundled together by yet another connective tissue into our structure that is a nerve. What does this sound an awful lot like? Three layers of connective tissue, isolating, bundling, and putting all of these things together. Absolutely muscles. And if you remember, the three layers, the ones around the cell in muscle was an areolar connective tissue that, based on location, we called an endomysium. Right? The ones that form the fascicle was a dense irregular connective tissue. I know some of you put dense regular on the exam. A dense irregular connective tissue that, based on location, we called a perimesium. And the one that formed the muscle was also a dense irregular connective tissue that, based on location, we call an epimesium. Well, we've learned this organization once, we're gonna learn it, we're gonna use it twice. Here, the individual nerves are surrounded by an areolar connective tissue that based on its location, we call an endoneurium. That nerve and 14 of his closest friends are gonna be bundled together into a fascicle by a dense irregular connective tissue that based on its location, we call a perineurium. And all of those fascicles, along with some blood vessels, are gonna be bundled together into the nerve by a dense irregular connective tissue that based on its location, we call an epineurium the exact same organization. Now here we're looking at it at a very low magnification. Let's increase the magnification. I've made a bit of a mess of this. So let's see if I can leave the words on here because that'd be nice if it doesn't get too much in our way. So let's see what the next slide looks like. There you go, that's not too bad. Uh, notice what we can see here. This is a high magnification view here. We see the nerve as a whole. And notice we're just looking right here. So notice this would be the connective tissue that is forming our fascicle. So that is the dense irregular connective tissue that is our perineurium. Notice two things, and I'm gonna draw this to make sure we emphasize it. Let me make sure my drawing line is thin enough. Notice right here on the inside, that is the axon. But notice there's this darker pink ring around the outside. That is not the endoneurium, that is the myelin. Remember, most of our axons are myelinated. So notice all of these donut shapes you see, the O part of the donut shape is the myelin. So there's myelin, and there's myelin, and here's myelin and the axon is the little bit in the center. 
and then the space in between them, right? This space in between them, that is the areolar connective tissue. That is the endoneurium. However, where you see this the best, and I love these types of drawings, and of course, uh, though the white at the center is the axon, the lightest part at the center is the axon. But here, let me show you the next slide. I think this next slide will help. Notice, as we've talked about, uh, myelin usually is, um, doesn't stain as well. So again, this nice white stuff around the outside is the myelin. But there are a few stains that stain myelin specifically. Oh, here, so here we go. Here we see the, all the myelin. This one, notice they're all clear because it doesn't stain. This is the one I want. Boom. What I love about this picture is here we can clearly see this particular stain stains myelin. So all the dark rings you see are the myelin. Obviously, the thing in the center of the myelin, maybe a little bit like cartilage, the stuff in the center of the myelin is our axon, and that is way too big. So in the center of the donut is our axon. The myelin is the dark ring on the outside. And then this clear space here would be the endoneurium. All the space that we see in between all the donuts is the areolar connective tissue. Uh, that is the endoneurium. And then out here, we see the perineurium that is forming the fascicle. So notice with this stain, you really can clearly see what is the connective tissue surrounding it, what is the myelin, and what is the axon. And again, this is anatomy we've really already learned. Endo, peri, and epi. The exact same of organization, the same way we bundle our muscle cells together. We bundle a lot axons together. What do you think about it makes sense? Muscle cells are long cylinder shaped structures. Axons are long cylinder shaped structures. So it's not surprisingly that we organize them in a similar fashion. All right. And with that, that is everything on your histology list. All right. I know we did skim a little bit over the spinal cord. We talked about a little bit we will talk a little bit more. I guess the one thing I do want to say here, because we won't emphasize it as much. So let's go ahead and go back and do that. So if you think about it, these cells, oh, and here's an even higher magnification. Remember, the myelin is formed by the Schwann cells. So this myelin right here, and let's emphasize this, this is myelin. It's a nerve, so it's in the peripheral nervous system. So the cell that is forming this myelin is the Schwann cell. This is a Schwann cell and it forms myelin, right? My desk is wooden, right? So it is a desk made of wood. This is myelin made of a Schwann cell. Same thing when we looked at it this way. This is myelin formed by a Schwann cell. Uh, Last thing I want to get, there's two things I want to get at. Notice here, because again, we won't emphasize it as much, but it is on your, uh, I don't know if it's on your microscopy list or if it's on your anatomy list for the spinal cord, but I want to make sure to emphasize it. Notice we talk about these two big, well, three big gray matter structures, the big three enlargements that are the horns. But notice there is a little bit of gray matter that connects the two hemispheres together. This is known as the gray commissure. So that is something I wanted to show you. Also, the central canal contains cerebral spinal fluid. And if you remember when we talked about it, and this is a horrible picture of it, so I like this one a little bit better. Um, here's the central canal up close. Remember, we said there are those ependymal cells. Ependymal cells are epithelial cells that line the inner cavities of our brain and spinal cord. So notice here, in our central canal, we have those epithelial cells. So here is an actual location where we can actually see those ependymal cells. And then here, I just wanted to show you, these are those same anterior gray horn cells. 
in an intact spinal cord. Notice when we look at it up close and it's all intact, the tissue is all together and it's hard to see where it is. And that's kind of why we take it and smear it across the slide. When we smear it across the slide, we get a much better view of the cells because normally they're tight, packed, packed tightly into this tissue. So if we spread it out by smearing it on there, we keep the cells intact, but if we break it all the rest of it apart so we can see it a little nicer. All right, but like I said, in, in lecture, we'll be getting much more into the anatomy and we will talk more about the spinal cord in depth there. But those are things I won't highlight as much, so I wanted to do this here so we have it on the histology. All righty. Any questions on any of that? I know we went a little long, but like I said, I want to make sure you guys got this information. Was this helpful? Did this work? Did this help at all? Useful at all? Are you all asleep now? Excellent. All right, cool. Excellent. All right, good. I'm glad. Hopefully this helps. Hopefully taking the time to draw these things and to label them yourselves will help you to master this material even more. All right. Any other questions then before I go ahead and stop the recording and end this? You're welcome, iPad. Any other questions? All right. In that case, you guys have a great weekend. Uh, study hard this weekend. And uh, remember uh, that there was some problems. Uh, I'll say this now. Uh, there were some problems uh, posting your exams. So they didn't get posted till last night. So if you had trouble uh, viewing your uh, fourth exams, they are available now. I will leave them available for a few more hours. So but around uh, uh, six or seven tonight, I will turn, the, turn those off. But I do want you to have that opportunity. And I, there was a delay getting that uh, resolved. So it's been fixed now. You should be able to uh, view your exams if you have not done so already. Uh, please make sure you do that. And uh, I will, uh, I will uh, close that down this evening. So make sure you take advantage of that. All right, guys, have a good weekend. Be safe. And I will see you on Tuesday. Study hard. Uh, talk to you then.